This is the secret history of a new romantic rebellion that changed the face of world culture before spiraling into a vortex of drug addiction and death. The body of Michael Rudetsky was found at a house owned by Boy George in North London. Their house got raided at 4.30 in the morning. That's when they took me to a nice secure prison in the country. Today, the cost of this scandalous and debauched behaviour is still being counted. Action, please. These peacock punks would become the new romantics. And at the heart of the scene were three characters. Stephen Harrington, soon to be known as Steve Strange. George O'Dowd, soon to be known as Boy George. And Peter Robinson, soon to be known as Marilyn. One of the great misconceptions, I think, about the whole new romantic scene is the idea that it was a, a reaction to punk, that it was the opposite of punk. It wasn't. It was a continuation of punk. The New Romantics wanted to have something that was more glamorous, more optimistic, and so they took some of the beliefs of punk, i.e., you know, everyone can be a star, everyone can be a musician, everyone can be an individual, but dressed it up, dressed it up with frills, if you like. There were hideous things like Thatcher and Reagan, but... Sometimes great art, you know, is really, you know, kind of comes from those sort of environments because I think you need something to react against. In 1979, George, Steve and Marilyn were among the first to flee the suburbs to the West End, dossing on floors and staying in squats around London's Warren Street, where students, punks and cross-dressers slummed it together. You just buy a building, you'd keep your eye on it and see, you know, if everybody's coming back, if it's boarded up, you just keep an eye on it. Then one day you just climb up the drain pipe and you go in through the back and then open the doors, turn the electricity on and Bob's your uncle. You got yourself a mansion in the middle of the West End. And all the buildings around that area are actually um, quite nice. So um, George decided, yes, we're going to have a squat. We went around there with a the crowbar. You know, Jeffrey would opened the door, and I think it was winter. The only great thing about the flat, there was no, no electricity, but the heating was on. And uh, we moved in there, there was no lights, um, we lived with candles. There were kind of, you know, various sort of serious squat-type meetings, but in actual fact, um, our agenda was really about getting dressed up and going out. And one night we got back from sort of clubbing, and my mum and dad had broken into my squat and filled my entire cupboard with food. It's very sweet. And then Marilyn moved in. Are you ready yet? Not yet, I'm taking my time. Our next door neighbour was a complete drunk, and when Marilyn was dressed in full drag, he would often see Marilyn coming in and out of the door and, and really thought Marilyn was a girl. Every time I go past him, past his house, the, the door would open, and he'd be looking at me like that. Like, you know, fancy me. And then this one particular day, he saw Marilyn out of drag. And later that night, he attacked our door with an axe. He started hammering on the door with the big chopping axe. Me and George had to jump out of a window, by a thing, you know, climb over on our fingertips and drop about 25 feet. It almost broke my leg. And um, we, we called the police, and they were just really hideous. They were just like, whatever, you're squatting, we're not going to help you. So that night, we literally had to go to another block of flats around the corner and break in. There was a lot of dancing and a lot of people having a lot of fun. And it wasn't how it was portrayed as uh, everyone stood against the bar just in case their, their, their makeup smudged and nobody moved. Yeah, there was definitely an element of posing and there was a lot of makeup and there was a lot of hairstyles and um, experimentation and cross gender dressing. I mean, the atmosphere was great. It was kind of like a lot of pretentious fashion, fashion victims kind of sitting around like this, you know, with dark glasses being new romantic and big shoulders. Like, I'm being seen at the police. You know, I'm at fashion college, that kind of thing. You could come and you could people watch if you were happy with that. Or if you were the peacock and you wanted the stage, then it, it, it was there for the taking. A lot of gay, uh, not quite sure I'm gay, uh, maybe I'll find out I'm gay kind of people. Steve's ultra-exclusive door policy at the Blitz was legendary. Sorry, you're not blonde enough. Only blonde. Once the people were inside, 
they felt that they were in their own sort of club and they weren't like being looked at as if they were in a fishbowl and everybody was gawping and staring at them. It was a club and that's why I was a strip so I was on the door. Steve was a fucking monster, I'm sorry. He was really, he loved, I mean, you know, queen of the ball. He loved turning people away. If you were turned away, it was literally like the end of your life. It was so, it was so important. This night, Mick Jagger did actually happen to turn up. Jagger was quite drunk and sort of said, you've got to let me in, don't you know who I am? One of the things that made Steve's name was uh, stopping Jagger, Mick Jagger, from getting into Blitz. I mean, that's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing story. There was some hack there from the Daily Mirror who made it front page news, like, two days later. Though he ran the club, but he also was like St Peter at the gate of, uh, uh, of heaven, you know. If he didn't want to let you into heaven, or the Blitz, you, you wouldn't get in. Night night. The first time I turned up there, I think I was turned away by Steve, and eventually I think Philip Salon kind of managed to get me in there. Night we're night. You know boy George, George, he did the cloakroom there for a while. It was before she was famous. I had to sit at the back in this little cupboard, take people's coats, and uh, I wasn't allowed to move, so it was a bit boring, but there was a little perch, so I'd sort of really dress up and, you know, try and get seen. If you walked past his cloakroom in the same outfit you had on last week, it would be, ooh, doing that one to death, aren't we, darling? I used to kind of pilfer people's handbags <laughs> or charge extra for coats. I was always kind of up in the price. And I got caught. He made the mistake of, um, uh, um, of stealing some money out of Judy's handbag and she went absolutely mad. And I just remember George rolling about on the floor with these two girls, like, fighting. <laughs> In the, in the middle of the club. Yeah, that was good. I think Anne Suggs, his wife, went up and butted him, I think. <laughs> and he's like, you bitch! Hair going all out. It was all really dramatic. I remember that was the talk of the, the scene for quite a long while, that was. I had to actually sack Boy George because um, on more than one occasion, people had complained about money going missing out of their pocket. And it was obviously George. I gave a command performance. I was like, I did not. I mean, I lied for my seat. The girls' toilets was full of blokes most of the time, sort of tarting themselves up, putting some hairspray on. Um, you don't really get that so much these days, but the feminine side was encouraged. At a certain point, when I really started wearing lots of makeup and sort of wearing wigs, I'd go to clubs and guys would ask me if they'd buy me drinks, and then they'd realise <laughs> that I wasn't a girl. And sometimes they'd still buy me a drink, sometimes they'd come home with me, or I'd blow them in the toilets. But, you know, I realised that the drag was powerful, and people used to say, we've got really pretty eyes, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, that would lead to one thing or another. So I realised it was a great way of attracting straight men. Peter Robinson had fully transformed into Marilyn Monroe and was soon crowned beauty queen of the Blitz. Marilyn turned up at the Blitz. Um, I can't remember who with, but he arrived and um, became something of an enigma and we all loved him. I guess he was about 15 or 16. People used to go, they say, what's your name? You go, Marilyn. And they used to go, what's your real name? And he'd go, Norma Jean. You will be queen. If there was any bloke there that looked vaguely straight, he like go up to him and go, fuck me, skinhead. That was one of his lines. I used to get people, guys like th thinking they were gonna like come home with me or something was gonna happen in a section way, and then I would get up at the end of the evening and say thanks, bye, and they'd always be like, I thought we were. I say, I'm oh, joking, aren't you? Fuck off, and walk off, walk away from him. I remember Marilyn completely fooled one of my friends, Jimmy. He, you know, got so drunk, he went home with Marilyn, and much to his uh, disappointment, you know, he found out, yeah. So, <laughs> the hard way, if you excuse the pun. <laughs> there was this one famous time when he actually sat on Bowie's lap and, um, you know, sort of said something like, enter my aching body. And Bowie wasn't pleased. I used to just like come, come and sit on my knee and then he sucked my neck and gave me a love bite and you know, it was just like that. Oh, David, you know, calm, calm down. We can be the heroes. Just for one day. 
The patron saint of the New Romantics, the godhead figure, the Buddha of the New Romantics was David Bowie. Uh, for a number of reasons. One, Bowie is the master of disguise, of the art of dressing up, of the art of chameleon changes. By the time David Bowie came down to the Blitz, there was, the, I think there'd been a phone call, and he came down there specifically to pick out extras for the Ashes to Ashes video. All these cool people were just sitting around, whatever, and then David Bowie walked in there, and the whole place just emptied, and they all ran up the stairs going, Bowie, Bowie! I thought, you bunch of wankers. We did take him in the back way, but word spread like wildfire. People were trying to get up the, from downstairs. We had to put extra security on. And then when he asked me to be in a video and would I actually pick the extras, I really did think I was going to be flown off somewhere exotic, being South End Beach. And we were all being pushed along by, um, all I can say, it was like a, a tip-up truck, really. The reason I actually did this movement like that was because the robe I was wearing kept getting caught in the, in the bloody truck that was pushing us along the sand. The new romantics were born, and as men's eyeliner became de rigueur up and down the country, record companies clamoured to launch the scene's leading lights as pop stars. It just illustrates the kind of the feed-in frenzy of the record companies. We all got record deals, basically. I mean, and, uh, you know, you could have got a record deal if, you know, if you put your toenail in the blitz, you would have got on top of the pops in those days. The first star to shoot from the scene would be Steve Strange, who joined forces with Rusty Egan and Midge Year to form Visage. pioneering electronics. We were using instruments that, uh, and drum machines and samplers and uh, all sorts of electronic things that hadn't happened. We didn't want our video to be like the rock music video of the time. We wanted to sort of create our own mini movies and sort of like it was, we had a very limited budget, believe it or not, we only had £5,000 for that video. I mean, Fade to Grey was bang, first album all over the world. Number one, Australia, Germany, France, Benny Lux, you know, et cetera, et cetera. With no touring and no band. That stupid five grand video that we got. We had Richard Shara doing makeup, who was like the god of makeup at the time. When it came to filming the video, Steve said to me, can you do the, um, you know, the talking bit? And I went, yeah, of course. And so, hence, I became the woman from the Fade to Grey video. She couldn't be less than anybody French. She told us, all right, hello, darling, how are you? So for her to mind them words was um, a very bit of clever trickery. Well, I was abysmal at my lip syncing, I'm afraid. <laughs> to see pictures of her in magazines when I was kind of at art college and things and um, sh she was a somebody, you know, and I was a nobody. <laughs> this made it absolutely clear. Pop music is as much about the way you look and this kind of transformation of the way you look and the fact that this working class boy from the valleys can become this sort of new Saclicite painting, if you like. I mean, he was the first new romantic star and he jokes about the fact that Boy George has never forgiven him for getting Fade to Grey out and having a huge hit with it. To be honest with you, when Steve first released that record, I hated it. <laughs> I was like... I was just so bitter and jealous. I just couldn't believe that he'd had a hit. And I think the worst thing was when I went home to Woolwich, they'd thrown this kind of new romantic party in the town hall, and they were playing Fade to Grey, and people were going on about it. At the time, it was like, why him and not me? It was just, you know... Everybody wanted to be famous, and the idea of him being famous before me was unbearable, but I got over it. In fact, I was more famous. <laughs> Spurred on by the success of Steve Strange, George made his own bid for fame with Culture Club, 
who would become one of the biggest bands of the 80s. But it all started with George's controversial debut on Top of the Pops, when in March 1982, a seminal moment in pop culture history found the cross-dressing cloakroom attendant of the Blitz beamed into millions of Middle England homes. For the first time on Top of the Pops, it's Culture Club. <laughs> I remember actually once we found out we were going to be on top of the pops, I remember sort of planning the most feminine look I could think of. I remember sort of, you know, getting this kind of hairpiece and braiding it and really working out what makeup I was going to wear. And, you know, I really thought about it a lot. Yeah, it was a big thing. I think when George appeared on top of the pops, um, for, for many people, it was. Um, yeah, is he or isn't he? It, it was total ambiguity. It was a very, very important moment that, you know, because it was the first time that someone had been on top of the pops and you really didn't know whether, whether it was a boy or a girl. I mean, George played up to that. That's what he wanted to create. He wanted to create confusion. When I was on top of the pops, I knew that there was going to be a big reaction to me being on the TV um, because following that performance, Radio 1, all the children's TV programs that had booked us all cancelled us. I mean, the reaction from Radio 1 was, what the hell was that? Yeah, people were outraged. They all said, we're not having him on. You know, he's, he's promoting homosexuality. You know, and I was in a very unsubtle way. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, it was just unstoppable. Everywhere you went, it was like little girls and old ladies. Really strange. While George was enjoying pop stardom, Marilyn was waiting in the wings for a slice of the action. Well, Marilyn was living in L.A. I mean, he moved to L.A. with his boyfriend, John, and he read an article about me and the face and obviously decided to come back and... She's having a bit of fame, I want some. I hated the fact that Marilyn was trying to be a pop star. You know, I remember he turned up at my shop with these kind of really dodgy dreadlocks. It was like, you know, you're just trying to be me. You know, it was just... Fuck off, you know. I remember the first single, you know, I remember sort of seeing the video. I mean, you know, and just thinking it was really vain, you know, like Marilyn photographing himself, you know, just totally self obsessed. <laughs> but he looked pretty. It was a great record, you know what I mean? And a great record also in the, of the period that it was released. The production was fantastic and it sounded great on the radio. You know, it was a winning combination. I mean, anyone who's got ears, you play that song to them. And it's, you can tell it's going to, you know, it's like, it's, it's brilliant, you know. And uh, it deserved to go to number one. Marilyn is a really, really strange case. He's one of the most fascinating, for me, of, of the new romantics. Uh, first of all, He's what Boy George would have wanted to have been in terms of looks. You know, make no mistake about it, when you saw Marilyn in the flesh, he was a really, really beautiful person. Really beautiful. The sort of, you know, pivotal moment was when he did the second single and uh, he appeared on top of the pops. He had the kind of monk's hood on. At the time, I thought, what does she think she's doing? <laughs> it's like... So feminine. It was just like people couldn't handle it. It's like theatre, you know what I mean? I was like messing around. I tried to make it interesting my way. It was the campest thing I've ever seen. It, because, you know, he was really beautiful. He had the sort of gold top on. And I remember people, you know, I think he was too sexual. People fancy me. Fancied, you know, past sense, me. So straight guys would like go, bloody hell, look at her, look at her. And their girlfriends would hate it that their boyfriends who were all straight would be like 
getting boneless for me. So it was, it was like a bit of a jarring mess with it all. You gotta cry. People were really freaked out, and that was the end of his career, really. I think that moment. <laughs> but with George, he's like cuddly and teddy bears and lollipops and la 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 la. You know, come, come, a chameleon. You know, nursery rhymes. George was quite hopeful that Marilyn would gain a certain amount of status that would put him on the same level as George, and that he'd have, you know, a buddy in crime to troll about with. Of course, it couldn't, didn't quite work like that. Marilyn had some great songs at the beginning, and, you know, as I, as I said, he looked fantastic. He had, he had all the right ingredients. But I think, in a way, this could sound strange, but he didn't have Boy George's granny appeal. Yes, George was a gender bender, but he was a very, very safe gender bender. He was a gender bender for the granny. The more you work, the more records you sell. So, you know, Cocaine became sort of freely available, um, and you know, obviously I was very young and very naive. Um, it wasn't cocaine that became a problem, like an addiction problem. It was the heroin. We'd be walking down the street, and it'd say, "Sorry, Steve," and it'd just go in the in, the, it'd just throw up in the curb, and then carry on as if nothing had happened. And I thought, that Steve, you've got to do something about that. That's just not." It's just not right. I was spending up to £1,500 a week on heroin. I never actually used needles, um, but, you know, even what, the way that I took heroin by chasing the dragon, um, you know, it, the more money you've got, the more heroin you take. Martin Kemp and Steve Norman from Spano Ballet. They invited me over to their house knowing that how bad the addiction had got and basically kept me prisoner there. Every one of Steve's friends would have done the same. But the trouble is, when you try and get off heroin, that uh, you have to change your lifestyle and you have to change your friends and move away from that. And Steve wasn't in a position to do that. Steve runs a nightclub. He's Steve Strange. He's on the door, weird and wonderful places that he creates, he wasn't in, in the right position to walk away from it. Looking back on it now, I, I feel like a, a real jerk for how kind they'd been to me. Um, and as soon as I was out of there, I was back on the street scoring and, you know, just throwing their kindness and their, you know, how caring they'd been in their face. All the characters that had started off as kind of party characters and club characters had all kind of gone too far. So all, all the makeup was starting to run, all the clothes were starting to fall off, everything was so, it was like the end of a party. And it was all getting messy and all getting really nasty and all turning mean. I wasn't aware that it was a problem. <laughs> you know, I was having fun. So, um, you know, I didn't really want to listen to anybody telling me what I should be doing. And in a way, you know, I did it after Culture Club. It wasn't like I did it at the height of my success. I did it in reverse. It was just really casual, you know. One minute I was smoking a spliff, next minute I was taking heroin. Lots of people were leaking information, saying that George was in a very, very bad way. Um, the media had employed uh, a lot of paparazzi to kind of follow him around and to chase him and to try to get some kind of evidence. I drove my car out a uh, paparazzi's Porsche, a guy called Dave Hogan. He was chasing me down um, Hamilton Terrace and uh, I was going to my dealer and I thought, you ain't fucking following me. And I literally spun the car around and I got out of the car and I said, you follow me, I'm going to ram my car into you. And he, he left. So there was a lot of that. Climbing over fences, you know, <laughs> hiding in trees. It was just so, you know, just all cloak and dagger. It was a nightmare. He really was taking so much, like, you know, half an ounce on the table or whatever. I mean, so I've never seen anyone take that amount of drugs. I mean, he was just, and you, I, I, you could get no sense out of him. And I just kept thinking, this is kind of really kind of going to come to a. You know, there's going to be tears, <laughs> you know, tears before bedtime with this thing. It really culminated with his own brother telling the son that George was on heroin, and that was a devastating bombshell. 
I remember I sent flowers round to his house, I think, at the time. You were shocked because, I mean, even though you knew, knew George wasn't a saint, you know, you, you know, and, and, and everything, you, you kind of didn't just didn't expect this kind of coverage associated, associated with such a drug like heroin, for example, which has always been the kind of underground, kind of dirty drug in, in, in a way. Fueled by intense media speculation, the police began a manhunt for Boy George, dubbed Operation Culture. In a series of raids, the police questioned George's friends and family before arresting Marilyn. The house got raided at 4.30 in the morning. I think that's when they, they took me to Paddington Green, you know, the most secure prison in the whole of the country. And they did all these like interrogation tactics, like good cop, bad cop. I mean, I just sat there crying for the whole time I was in Paddington Green. I was just like crying, it's a vile. And that picture was when I was being driven into the police station by a lo lo load of press people outside. And as the car went through, the gates opened and the police car went in, I just turned and stuck my tongue out and he went, plus, 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 plus. And then that picture like that was on, on all the covers the next day. I felt very like vulnerable and stuff. It was like, I thought, I really thought I was going to go to prison. I think the crime is being caught. It's not doing it, because they were all doing it. You know, um, there was this one particular editor, I wish I could say his fucking name, I hate him, but anyway, I remember him interviewing me and just like, thinking, what's wrong with him? And then years later, he <laughs> realised he was fucking wired out of his mind. Police have confirmed that an American musician who's been working with the pop singer Boy George died from a drug overdose. The body of Michael Rudetsky was found at a house owned by Boy George in North London. Michael Rudetsky's death uh, at, at George's Hampstead home was really the culmination of the story. The ideal headline for the press would have been, sadly, George dead. They couldn't get that, but that really put a line under it, and I think it shocked a lot of people, and it certainly would have shocked George himself into thinking, there but for the grace of God go I. The ultimate price had been paid, and now, two decades later, the 80s icons are still trying to pick up the pieces from the ashes of their past. It's like I don't want to answer the phone, and I don't like people knocking at the door. And, you know, you don't like going out of where I am. It's very peculiar. The mid-80s spelled the end of the road for our new romantic heroes. The national mood had changed as charity events like Live Aid created a greater social conscience, which contrasted sharply with the self-indulgent trappings of the peacock punks. The legacy they created, however, still lives on to influence music and fashion today. 250 kids really did change the way that we lived and looked and played and partied in this country. Forever. There ain't no going back now to that time when everything was shut and everybody looked like an extra from on the buses, which is what it was like before Steve Strange started the Blitz. The blurring of genders, the, the, the first time that guys were wearing makeup and spent more time getting ready than women did, was something that was peculiar to that time and it had an incredible shock value. So it wouldn't have the same effect now. One of the interesting things about the 80s is that at the time, everybody hated it. Everybody slagged it off, and now everyone loves it. Which probably is a measure of how bad things are now. But I remember at the time, nobody liked the 80s. All the bands were shit, the hairdos were too much, they hated all of us. And now it's like suddenly, oh, we love you. It's amazing. You know, it's absolutely amazing. But I think sometimes you need a distance from a decade to actually revalue it. Back in London, Boy George is also still performing. Please welcome to Tonight I'm doing a free gig for Action Aids at Home House. I'm currently kind of trying to set up my own online label deal with Atlantic Records in America because I don't want to sign another record deal ever again. I haven't had a deal since 95. You sheltered me from
doing fashion line, I do photography, you know, painting, whatever, just anything creative, you know. Anything that allows me to kind of express myself freely. And I make enough money to kind of afford to do my own videos and, uh, you know, decide what I do with my work without compromising too much. And that's really, you know, the ultimate goal for me. Marilyn is now living with his mother in North London, where he's overcoming drug and mental health problems. But his road to recovery and hoped for career relaunch is being hampered by a debilitating psychological condition. I've got agoraphobia. So, so I, I don't like being out. <laughs> in, in, you know, I like being <laughs> in the womb. It's like I don't want to answer the phone and I don't like people knocking at the door. And, you know, I don't like going out of where I am. It's very peculiar. If I can get my medical things sorted and it's not, it doesn't get any worse, I've, I've got some really brilliant um, potential things going on that I have, to, I have to be fit enough to be able to take it on. And right this very minute, I just can't. 